All right, Andrew, I have four o'clock. All right, awesome. <clears throat> okay, we might as well get started and um, other people might hop on. That, that's often what happens a few minutes into the presentation. But welcome everyone to another Friends from the Field webinar. This is a series um, co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, a community conservation organization for the Blue Hill Peninsula and Island Heritage Trust, a land um, conservation organization for Deer Isle, Stone, and Stonington and the surrounding islands. Uh, my name is Lander and I work for Blue Heritage Trust as the outreach coordinator. Um, and I'm going to introduce our guest speaker in just a minute, but I'm going to pass it over to Jake from Island Heritage Trust to do a little bit of tech help first. Thanks, Lander. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining and I'm happy to be here. Um, one of the most important features for tonight is your chat feature, which I think a lot of you are already using, but that should be at the center bottom of your screen. Uh, and as Rosemary is, you know, presenting, you can ask questions throughout the presentation, but I think generally we'll leave most of the um, actual response for the end segment and Lander and I will go through them and, and ask your questions for you, unless you'd like to participate with your audio and ask Rosemary your question yourself, which I believe if you see in the participant list on the top right, I think of that, you'll see a little hand and if you click it, it'll turn blue and that Lander will have the option to open your audio up and you can ask your question directly. Other than that, I'll hand it back over to Lander for our formal introduction. Thank you so much, Jake. Okay, we're so excited to welcome Rosemary Seaton this evening. She is a marine mammal stranding coordinator with Allied Whale, the Marine Mammal Lab at College of the Atlantic, and has worked with marine mammals for over 30 years, mainly in her native Canada and the USA. Thank you so much for being with us, Rosie. Thank you, Lander. Thanks, Jake. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you all. Um, in, it's so weird being in Zoom land. And I feel like I'm just going to be talking to myself in my kitchen. But that's okay. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about marine mammal stranding response. And I sit in the northern half of Maine, uh, which then begs the question, so who looks after the southern half? And I'll, I will get to that in, in talking about the stranding network. Um, so I will talk about what is a stranding because I figured, well, I guess not everyone might know what a stranding means in the context of what we do. Um, also, why we respond in the first place, although I'm sure you could imagine some of the reasons. Uh, I'll touch on species. Um, I'm not going to go a whole lot on species because th those could be lectures unto themselves. Um, but I'll do some case studies that will sort of show some of the logistics that we deal with in our northern half of Maine, the kinds of terrain that we work on and so on. And then a little bit about seal behavior, normal seal behavior, and I've got a little video at the end that I took of a seal pup this past summer uh, that sort of is illustrative. So, uh, and, and just, you know, I wanted to keep this front uh, slide on because this little harbor seal pup is just so darn cute, so. All right, so what is a marine mammal stranding? Uh, well, to us, it's, it's basically an animal that is out of habitat and is in distress. Um, and that can be, as you can imagine, due to numerous things. Uh, obviously, to illness, uh, can be human impacts like entanglement or vessel strikes. Um, it can be, uh, and this is a big thing that we deal with, is stress due to human harassment. And I'll be talking about more about that later. Uh, natural injuries uh, being lost, so it seems, perhaps for some dolphins coming into a bay and not familiar with the bathymetry. Um, you know, really, why they strand is uh, it's case by case, and it's, um, um, it's something that we don't entirely know what is going on. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, the pictures here, in case you're wondering, this is on the lower left, is a gray seal pup who was named Valentine's. Uh, for the reason, if you see the date on there, it was a very, very cold Valentine's Day, February 14th. Uh, this is Stonington, actually, at the Harbor Master's house. Uh, this pup came up, which is one that we rescued. And this whale that stranded is a, uh, uh, a say whale, which was unusual for us to get a dead say whale, which is a kind of baleen whale. Um, anyway, that's what those animals are. Uh, out of habitat for a cetacean, and first of all, cetacean are, are whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and collectively we call them cetaceans. Uh, basically, whales, if you see a whale, a live whale on a beach, it shouldn't be there. Uh, that is not normal. They're not built for being on beaches. Uh, they are animals that are heavy and large for the most part. Even the dolphins are large enough animals that if you're lying 
on a beach environment, they can't take that. They can crush internal organs. As well, they're not ambulatory on land. They can't move around. And on top of that, they have no fur that would protect themselves from the sun, so they can get sunburn. Um, so that that's easy. A uh, little bit different in this case. This is not so much a live stranding. This is a killer whale that is utilizing a very risky feeding strategy of scooting up onto the beach to try and get that seal that's there. Or see, I think that's a fur seal. I'm not quite sure, um, but it's it, that. That can sometimes happen where they overshoot and then they make a mistake and they end up stranding. Um, I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, why do they strand? Uh, it's a complex uh, phenomenon. It's been going on for millennium. Uh, it's something that naturally happens. Um, I will divide into mass strandings and single strandings. Uh, you may be more familiar with the mass strandings. These typically involve what are called odontocetes. These are the toothed whales, like all your dolphins, porpoises, sperm whale, killer whale. These are all toothed whales. Um, why they would mass strand, like in this example of New Zealand, uh, they're not sure why all these pilot whales came in. One thing that comes into this behavior is a behavior that they have, and that's their social behavior of being in, uh, they create tight social uh, social groups that are very um, that they bond together. So, you know, if one goes in, they all go in, kind of thing. Very different from baleen whales and baleen whales like humpbacks. Perhaps you've been on a whale watch and seen humpback whales. Uh, these are animals that you might see in a group, but that's a, not a tight knit social group. They'll just as easily uh, split up and form new groups or pairs or what have you. So by dint of not um, being uh, creating these social groups, you're not going to get a mass stranding of uh, baleen whales. You can get single strandings of baleen whales as you can of the tooth whales as well. And in fact, we've had, thankfully, we don't get a lot of cetacean strandings, live ones. We do get dead ones coming on shore. Uh, but live ones, uh, we had one up in, I think it was either Addison or Millbridge, uh, a common dolphin came up a river it clearly sick and it, you know we got in the truck to take it to the vet and it, it died before we even drove down the road so any single dol dolphin species close to shore by itself is a big red flag um, now i said that it's toothed whales at mass strand so this may be a bit peculiar here we have say whales and say whales are a baleen whale and i just said that they don't mass strand and yet you had over 300 say whales that were found dead off the coast of Chile. In this particular instance, what they felt happened was that there was some event offshore, like a harmful algal bloom or something that killed them as an event. And then they just sort of drifted in, maybe currents sort of had them congregate in this sort of uh, area, which is actually quite remote. And because they were uh, discovered sort of well after the fact, uh, they couldn't get really good samples on these animals and, and really couldn't do good workups or necropsies on them. Um, so that, that was a really sort of bizarre case. Now pinnipeds, pinnipeds are your seals, sea lions, and walrus. Um, they're semi-aquatic. So being semi-aquatic means that you live part of your life in the ocean, but you're just as adept at living on shore as well, or you're happy on shore. You don't need to be in the water. And for some seals, they really do want to be out of the water, particularly when they just want to rest or when they're molting. Molting is an annual event where they have that new fur pushes out the old fur. Because it's an energetically demanding um, um, response, uh, they really like to keep out of the water. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a little more difficult with pinnipeds. If you get a seal, you look at it and go, well, how do I know if there's something wrong with it? Um, I will say that this seal here, which is actually the same pup that was in the first slide, this pup is a nice a plump animal. Uh, it's got its nice adult coat, um, our full term coat as a pup. And so it's looking pretty good. These other three, I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Uh, and when we come back to um, looking at um, pinnipeds. So why do we respond to uh, marine mammals in the first place? Part of the impetus is what's known as the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So a little bit of uh, the legal 
uh, aspect to strandings. Um, the Marine Mammal Protect Protection Act is really an amazing uh, piece of legislation. Um, it was mandated, uh, interestingly, as an ecosystem management-based approach. It wasn't sort of seen as just marine mammals. They were looking at the whole ecosystem, and that's really unique. So this is really almost, uh, I'd say, avant-garde back in the early 70s, that they were taking, or, uh, taking an ecosystem uh, system-based approach uh, to protecting marine mammals. Part and parcel of that was protecting the marine mammal, but it was beyond that. It was the whole ecosystem itself. What uh, spurred this uh, protection, this um, enacting the Marine Mammal Protection Act was two, largely two events, um, sort of ongoing events, and that was the, uh, um, all the dolphins being killed in the, per the, dolph the tuna pursing fishery. Uh, you may have heard about that back uh, in the 60s and 70s where purse saners were out. They would just scoop up all these tuna, but dolphins would be lumped up with that. And that's what you call bycatch. It's getting um, uh, a, a species that's not the targeted species. The other issue were the killing of harp seals for the fur trade. And it was those two issues that largely um, uh, spurred on the um, Marine Mammal Protection Act being passed by Congress. And you know they say the issues have changed somewhat. Some have changed, some are the same, but other things have come into play like uh, pollution and plastics and so on. So we have new issues now, uh, but the bottom line is protecting marine mammals. So uh, just a little bit about it. Uh, in the US, it's basically saying you, you just can't do anything to marine mammals. You can't hunt them, you can't kill them, you can't harass them, torment, annoy, don't spit on them, don't do anything. It is against the law. Uh, it's that broad. Um, and harassment in an amendment in 94, they divided that term because you can, uh, you know, harassment from just annoying it, making it the seal move off the beach versus killing it, they're really quite dramatically different. So they have level A harassment is the, re the, the ramped up version. That's injuring or killing a marine mammal. The level B harassment is more what we have to deal with, and that is uh, disrupting a marine mammal. Uh, perhaps you were on the beach and you want it, that cute seal pup, I just have to go pat it, and they do, or I need to bring it home because it's by itself and it's missing its mom and, and so on. Uh, that's a level B harassment. And it, you know, and interestingly, it, it's, it's well meant from people just wanting to help that marine mammal out. So we keep that in mind. Um, Another term that will come into play is something called a take, and that comes from whaling literature. Uh, a take means, uh, well, in whaling days, if you killed or even injured a whale, that was, each one was a take. In this context, if I pat that seal or I pick up that seal and put it back in the water, or if I uh, go too close to a whale, especially a right whale, then that is a take. Uh, I have come too close, I'm harassing, I'm stressing it out. So this is an example of a take. And this was a beluga whale that was actually here off MDI named Poco back, I think it was 2004. Um, he, uh, the whole, I could do a whole lecture on Poco. Uh, suffice to say, this was a beluga that seemed to like boats and people sort of joined in the fun, as you can see. Um, so this is against the law, uh, cavorting <laughs> with a whale like this. Um, and the latest human-induced stressor is the selfie and everyone using their cell phone cameras um, to do this. Uh, this is uh, not here, it's California, and note to self, we don't have sea lions here. Um, we, we only have seals. And um, so, but, but people will go up and take photos, and, and I have some other photos of these events showing people with putting their children next to these seals, that can bite them, by the way. Um, they also harbor diseases that can be transferred to you and vice versa. You could have a cold and give that to the seal. It's called zoonotic diseases. So perhaps people don't realize that, but you can make a seal sick and vice versa. Uh, so with NOAA Fisheries, we, they've come up with a lot of messaging. In fact, I went to a messaging workshop last fall uh, trying to sort of shake down what were some of the important messages and what we realized is that people just getting too close. If we can keep people away, then they won't be picking them up, they won't be patting them, pouring water on them, taking them home, etc. So the, the big deal was 
don't get too close. Well, how do I know that if I'm too close? And so we've come up with some sort of strategies that will help people uh, know when they are. Um, kayakers will get too close. I brought that up that, uh, you know, kayaks are wonderful. I, I know I do kayak myself. But if you come near a seal colony and you think, oh, I'm nice and quiet, I'm not noisy like a motorboat, you actually are more disturbing because it freaks them out. They are, they are taken by surprise and they flush into the water. Uh, and if that's repeated with every kayaking tour that goes by, that's a real stressor on that animal. Repeated, repeatedly being stressed out is very hard in the system. And uh, the pups, um, I like this one here in the top left, that's so succinct. I'm resting because I'm tired. I don't need to swim. Give me my space, stay back. That's, that's really the message, I, I'm okay. And if you don't know, give us a call is the bottom line. Phone the police, phone the SPCA, phone whoever, if you're not sure, because I get that. We all get that in the stranding world that, uh, you know, you see an animal and go, I know nothing about seals, but it's a baby and it's by itself. That, just that yeah, that just doesn't seem right to me so just give us a call and and we can work it from there uh and then this other poster mom my pups need rest and yeah don't be silly we're trying to get clever uh and then we use the whole COVID-19 keeping your space and well seals need physical distancing too so um so I'm just getting that message in there about the important thing is really, really give marine mammals their space. And in fact, for any wild animal. Um, coupled with the Marine Mammal Protection Act was the, um, this program uh, that was added in 1992 amendment, uh, the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program. And one of the components, uh, which uh, had National Marine, Life Sur uh, sorry, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, was the designated uh, agency to coordinate all these various activities. Um, the stranding networks fall under their purview, and that's what we're a part of. Um, now, what is really key um, in terms of why strandings or responding to strandings are important, um, marine mammals are um, key predators in the ocean, and what they're feeding on is a lot of what we're feeding on that, that we eat. Um, and keep that in mind. And so if you get marine mammals, like this little seal, uh, in distress, showing signs of being sick, something's amiss, they've got lesions, respiratory illness, it may be indicative of something else going on in the ocean. Um, and what happens, we're really on the front lines in being able to recognize this. And what can happen is if I get a load of seals dying in my area, so you get spatial or temporal die-offs, I mean, this happens in the human world too. Look what we're going through now. Um, and so we, we can recognize that there's something going on and we have, uh, NOAA can enact what's called an unusual mortality event. And I mentioned that we have, I think I did, um, for humpbacks, minke whales, and um, right whales ongoing right now. That's three. We just had a seal one that closed, uh, thankfully. Um, so it means that we're always on, and especially if we get a um, live or dead uh, in distress, uh, one of those whale species, minkies, humpbacks, or right whales, then we really have to do some uh, robust sampling on the animal if it's dead. All the stops come out in trying to get all information that we can on those animals, they're critical to understanding why they're dying off. Um, so. The, the monitoring of marine mammals and their health is really critical uh, as in a way they're like a proxy for the ocean and what's going on and keeping it healthy. And I, I always like to say I look at it from an individual population and ocean point of view that for strandings I want to I care about the individual like this little seal here uh, which is one I did take to rehab by the way. Uh, but then on a population level you, you want to care for the population of harbor seals keep them healthy because even though they're robust population right now, they weren't always that way. Um, and you can have some virus just strike them down. Uh, and then the ocean, the greater uh, marine ecosystem. So it's, it's sort of the way I look at it anyway. So the bottom line is that the stranding network really is on the front lines to recognize those red flags. Um, so the stranding network that I've been talking about, what is it? And I'll just jump to this uh, map because it really shows it well. 
Um, the stranding network is throughout the US uh, continental and also Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. We are in Maine here, part of the greater Atlantic region. It used to be called the Northeast region, but I think uh, because it, uh, the Northeast region is Virginia to Maine, perhaps Virginians didn't feel that they were really Northeast and, and I guess they're not. So greater Atlantic was more descriptive and that's who we are. So we're from Virginia to Maine is the greater Atlantic region that we're a part of. We have our regional coordinator um, who is based in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, and jumping back here, uh, as an agency, uh, we have what's called a stranding agreement uh, given to us from NOAA Fisheries. This is an agreement that allows us to handle uh, legally. Uh, we're authorized to handle all marine mammals, for us, live and dead marine mammals. But each stranding agreement is specific to, um, to an agency. So for us at Allied Whale, uh, if you went to Article 4 in the, our stranding agreement, it's blank because Article 4 is all about doing rehab. So we do not do rehab. We are authorized to hold overnight. Uh, we stabilize the animals. You can see in some uh, dudes and some tube feeding here. Um, and, um, but we can handle all live and dead. Um, and, as, and some agencies will do rehab only, some do both. Our colleagues at the Marine Mammals of Maine do both response and uh, triage and uh, rehab. So they've got their hands full down there. Uh, we are mandated by NOAA to collect minimally what's called level A data. And that's data that's basic. Uh, the date, the location, the species, who examined, was it dead alive, what'd you do with it, so on and so forth. That's level A. We're mandated to collect that on each animal as safely as we can. Um, this COVID summer uh, was difficult to get to some places. And so this is where photos and people's descriptions were really helpful. Uh, we do necropsies, uh, that's an autopsy on the animal. Uh, you can see Lindsay and me here. Uh, with, this was a minke whale that was at Isle of Ho this past summer, uh, examining this uh, juvenile minke whale, uh, getting samples and so on uh, on that animal. Uh, so that would be level and B and C data when you get those tissue samples. Uh, which heightens the analysis and understanding of that animal and the event itself. Outreach is important, educational outreach. Uh, we train volunteers. Uh, we do lectures like this, workshops, conferences, and so on. And importantly, I like to get um, citizens involved. We go to the different towns to, uh, when they report an animal, uh, I like to get to know the people that have reported it. And in fact, they often come on as volunteers and it's a fun part of my job. I make some great friends as I did this summer. Um, and I just do want to do a shout out, speaking of the Stranding Network, uh, the photo in the lower uh, right hand corner, uh, it's Ashley and Brian of Seco Science Center in New Hampshire, who were really incredibly helpful this summer in getting animals to Massachusetts because of the stay at home order due to COVID, we could not cross into um, well into New Hampshire. So I would take animals just over the border to a open parking area, which was the liquor store, that was handy. And, um, and they would just, without touching my vehicle, take the pup and so on and take it down the coast. I called it the COVID seal relay and they were uh, a massive part of that and I'm really appreciative. Major part of the network, that's what we do. We help each other out um, uh, with, with animals. All right, uh, moving along. Uh, this is where we are and that is the area that we look after, Rockland up to Callis, Maine and all the islands in between, which if you stretched out all those peninsulas and islands, it roughly translates to 2,600 miles. So uh, we do have our work cut out for us. Southern Maine, who looks after that area? Uh, that's the marine mammals of Maine. And so they look after just south of Rockland down to the New Hampshire border. Species, um, I'd love to talk more about all these guys because they're all so incredible. Uh, but I'll just do a snapshot of each. Um, harbor seals are the ones that we deal with the most, uh, especially pupping time. And these are two little uh, nice full-term happy harbor seals. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they're, they're the species we deal with the most. And our busy time really is, is spring into summer. Gray seals, uh, we also have um, 
they're a larger seal. And in fact, their pupping time is right now, interestingly. They're uh, December to February. So we're in December, they're, they're pupping. And um, larger, larger uh, animal. And um, they're an animal that the pup is born with this birth coat, this white birth coat. And I'm gonna talk about that in terms of harbor seals uh, in a little bit. Top here, we have hooded seals. These seals, hoodeds and also the harp, are actually Arctic seals that come down from Canada. Uh, the hoodeds are really interesting. They, we haven't had any in the last few years. They can appear really almost in any month, which is really odd. I, I actually have four in one July, um, but they are an Arctic seal. Uh, well, they're born on the pack ice up north. Um, they're only one genetic stock, and um, yeah, once in a while we'll, we'll get them here. Harp seals, we had numerous harp seals here this winter. Uh, Arctic seal, uh, and if you're, you know, the, uh, the poster child uh, showing the, the nice little fluffy white seal, that's a baby um, white coat, a harp seal. That's how they look when they're born, which only lasts for a few days looking like that. They get what's called the beater coat. This is a juvenile, and that's a nice, healthy looking uh, harp seal, nice and bright and alert. In fact, I tried to get close to it to get a closer photo, and it was up looking. I mean, that's the alert pose, like I'm watching you. And uh, I, I just, I, you know, I crossed that invisible line, so I just backed right up and, and, and snapped some photos with the zoom lens. And, uh, but that's, that's just such a perfect seal. Here's the adult version, and I think you can see why it's called a harp seal, because it looks like a lyre harp on its back. That marking only emerges when they're about four years old. And we had, I think we had six adults in our area this past winter. Whales, uh, again, these are just going to be quick snapshots. Uh, we do get humpbacks and minkies are probably the ones that we tend to deal with in terms of dead whales. Uh, fin whales, beautiful whale, second largest animal on earth. Uh, we do have wonderful fin whales out here. Um, they, um, we only had, I know it was about 20 years ago we had a dead fin whale, but don't tend to get many uh, strandings of them. But just to make you aware that we do have them. Northern right whales, the most endangered of the great whales. Um, uh, as I said, we have an unusual mortality event on for the northern rights and also for humpback and minke whales. And the humpback, uh, just to throw in the flukes, of course, uh, is what we actually deal a lot with in allied whale, because uh, we, we curate uh, the North Atlantic and also the Antarctic humpback whale catalogs. And just so you know, we can identify individuals based on their fluke patterns. And this is a humpback whale, uh, her name is Siphon. And that comes into play as stranding coordinator, um, because if we get a dead humpback whale that its fluke pattern is still visible, um, then we can hopefully identify who that whale is, which is not always a happy occasion when we do. Uh, small cetaceans that we get uh, include uh, probably major players, the harbor porpoise. Uh, this is actually from this summer. Uh, my colleague Lindsay and one of our students went out to collect it. This was a calf, and I know there's no, no reference point, but that animal is only about two and a half feet, uh, just a little fellow. Uh, harbor porpoise get up to about five feet, and they're the smallest uh, toothed whale that we have here. We will uh, get Atlantic white-sided dolphin strand. This one came in alive just a couple of months ago. This was on Deer Isle, and uh, uh, it died um, almost immediately, and, um, and the kind folks that reported it brought it in for us, and uh, we collected it. A uh, common dolphin down here is another um, that we get. And it sort of begs the question, you got a porpoise, you have a dolphin, what's the difference? Um, just very quickly, dolphins tend to be bigger. They tend to have what's called a beak out there. Uh, porpoises have a rounder head. Uh, there's other differences as well, as well in terms of their dorsal fin and their teeth and also behavior, which I'm not gonna go into, but just, just be aware they are different, uh, different families even. Uh, just continuing on small cetaceans, uh, pilot whales we get. Um, you usually see pilot whales more in the fall, uh, but again, they're a toothed whale. You can see there's several right there. Uh, we have had the odd individual strand or float in dead. 
This bottom species is called a Rissos dolphin, also known as a great grampus. And this was actually an animal that came in alive in a cove, and, uh, and then it was found dead. Um, so just to be aware that we do get those species here as well. And there's others, uh, you know, we've had sperm whales, um, oh, pygmy sperm whales we've had. So there are other whale species that we can get as well, but these are some of the perhaps better known players that we get. Uh, cases, um, these are kind of fun. Hopefully I've still got time to talk about a few of the whale and seal cases because it sort of um, encompasses, um, you know, some of the logistics that we deal with. This was a humpback whale we had up in Lubeck, Maine, uh, back in 2018, uh, female. And one thing about Northern Maine is that we have these wonderful cobbled beaches. Um, I, I swear I'm gonna break my ankle someday on these <laughs> stones. Um, but it made getting this whale in rather difficult. We we're also almost up in the Bay of Fundy, so we had very energetic tides, energetic currents. Um, and we had to get a boat out to tie on to this whale and bring it in. We thought we could land it on the shore, but unfortunately the bathymetry is such it drops off and it just kind of got caught. Uh, if you can see in that lower photo, that's about as close as we could get it in. So we had to kind of wade out to get a measurement, as you can see in the top left. And at one point I got tossed into the brink because the, uh, the, the waves, they just, the current just pulled my feet out from under me and down I went, uh, wearing waders as well. So that was good fun. Um, so uh, yeah, good times in Stranding World. Um, you can see the flukes here on this humpback. Unfortunately, it was too degraded to be able to get the, discern the pattern uh, to get an idea of who that animal was. However, I did in the end get um, my level A data and I also got skin samples they'll be sent out for genetics and hopefully we can ID the animal based on uh, the genetics. A um, few others, this was this summer, um, August 12th in Millbridge. Um, the kind folks, Patty and her husband, Steve. Patty had eagle eyes, they were out in their boat and she says, I think that's a dead whale on shore. And sure enough, it was a, a very, very dead minke whale. And again, because minke whales are, uh, there's an unusual mortality event that's open on minke whales. Uh, I thought, oh, I've really got to get to this animal, even though it's really decomposed. So they kindly took me out in their boat. We, we thought, okay, do we feel comfortable doing this because of COVID? So we just got all, you know, masks and kept our distance and, and we managed just fine. So I'm really appreciative Again, it's getting, you know, when people are involved that help out, it's, it's just, it's so much fun and, um, and, and so incredibly helpful. So uh, I owe them a few beers actually when they're next up here. Um, so you can see the terrain that we're working on. Uh, it's, it's so difficult. Uh, the first humpback we had at Isle of Ho was also in this sort of uneven rocks, uh, rock weed, very slippery. And I'm coupled with that that we have to deal with logistically is it has whale grease and has snarged up as we say all the rocks so the rocks the rocks were actually quite greasy on top of that so to, it looks like wouldn't that be just easy to walk around it wasn't i had to walk and and <laughs> it's a wonder i didn't kill myself but uh, i had that boat hook which was really helpful just to to get around to the animal and get the samples to do the measurements and so on um, and you can see that we have to bring all kinds of gear. This is minimal gear actually, so. But the scenery is beautiful. You, you can't beat that. <laughs> so, um, this was a right whale calf, sadly. Uh, it was a boat strike, uh, propeller lacerations on the tail stalk known as the caudal peduncle. And uh, we got out um, to the animal and collected level A and also I, what I'm doing is getting uh, samples cross sections of the um, lacerations and then those samples get sent to, to the histopathologist, the veterinarian, who can then um, look at the, the cells under the microscope and can confirm that it was a vessel strike, that they'll see the damage to the cells is consistent with uh, a boat strike. Again, you gotta love down East Maine and the working conditions, but the scenery is beautiful. 
uh, but you get these, the boulders, the rocks, and, uh, and again, you've got the whale grease. And in fact, all this up on the rocks here on these bluffs, that's all whale grease. I thought I could get to the front. I'm trying to get a straight length here and I, could, I couldn't do it. So we had to get the uh, measure it from the top of the cliffs down to the end of the tail. And so being a humpback whale, it should have nice black and white markings on the fluke here, but it's so decomposed that those markings are long gone. But interestingly, this was one that was genetically identified to a known individual uh, whose name escapes me right now, but it was uh, one that we knew. Finally, a, a nice sandy beach. And this is Sand Beach in Acadia National Park. Some of you may know it well. Um, and uh, it was a, this actually was an animal that was at up north on Head Harbor Island and it went for a swim because dead whales, by the way, do swim because they have the horizontal tail and it undulates in the water. So they'll swim around two knots. Um, and so it came down and I got the call, phone call from NOAA Fisheries uh, saying, I don't want to mess up your nice Sunday afternoon in August, but you have a dead whale on Sand Beach. It's just the most popular beach in Acadia National Park. Um, but again, uh, you get lemons, you make lemonade, and, and we went on to the beach. Uh, there's me here and uh, my assistant Mindy and there's Laura. Um, we have a wonderful ranger from Acadia National Park. And that's another thing is that we work with so many different agencies who are just absolutely fantastic, including Acadia National Park. Maine, Maine, Maine Marine Patrol have been awesome. Uh, just shout outs to, to both those agencies among many, many others. Um, and so we had this uh, minke whale on the beach. Uh, we thought, well, we can't necropsy it right there, uh, but we had permission to get it into the next cove, but then we had to get it off this beach. And I don't know if you can see, but there's rocks in the way at low tide here. So we got a line on the tail, got, and we, uh, and people got involved. Everyone who was on the beach the next day came and they all got onto the beach. It was like a big tug of war. And we pulled the minke whale. Uh, so it was free of the rocks. And then we had our vessel that was able to come in and, and we towed it next door and, and, uh, and we did the necropsy and so on. But again, it's, um, it's figuring out logistics. It's always uh, kind of interesting. Um, my mind's going a mile a minute when, when I get a call and I think, okay, this is, <laughs> these are things I need to do, uh, but it, it's good fun. Okay, seals. I had to throw in Rufus. He's my all-time favorite harbor seal. Uh, this was back in 2005 and he's from Blue Hill. I think it was, uh, what are they called? The Falls, Blue Hill Falls. And, uh, you know, I got the call, so I, this is May 19th, and I went down to this little fella, um, and they, the people said, well, his name is Rufus. And I said, okay. And, uh, and, you know, he gives me this cheeky little wave, and, um, you know, I, my heart just melted, and I thought, oh, I really want to take him. And then I had to be more objective and think, do you need to take him? Because you don't want to be removing a perfectly healthy seal that's just waiting for mom. That's what harbor seals do. Moms will go off and feed. Sometimes the pups will go with them because they are able to swim right from the get-go. Harbor seals are. Uh, but sometimes, hey, it's a baby. It's tired. It doesn't want to go with mom. And so uh, they'll just go up on shore like this. Um, but one thing that was a red flag to me is that it is a premature harbor seal because it is sporting a lanugo coat. Uh, the lanugo is the white birth coat, which gray seals are born with them. Har um, harp seals are born with them. Uh, but these guys are not. They shed that in utero. So if you do get a harbor seal pup with a lanugo coat, um, it is one of the characteristics that's identifying as a premature. And, you know, you want to be careful with those preemies, as you can imagine. And so we, we brought Rufus in, and this is him. We held him overnight, and he's quite comfy. And, but you can see how that, here it is, a wet lanugo coat, and here it is, all dry and fluffy. That lanugo coat, I tell you, it starts coming out pretty quickly. And if you have allergies, good luck. It just goes everywhere. Um, it really is this protective coat, um, but they don't need it once they're born because they're born in spring and it's sort of nicer weather. And in fact, when we transport a preemie, we have to be really careful that it doesn't overheat because it's got that extra fur coat on. So. so Rufus went to rehab. He did really well. They absolutely adored him there. He was number 177. 
And if you're wondering why he's wearing a little hat, um, it's just a little marker that they put on their heads so they know the individual animals because they got to make sure that they each get their food and maybe some have meds and so on and so forth. That little uh, tag will come off when they molt. So he'll be wearing it when he's released, or he was, uh, but that would be long gone. So I always wonder where Rufus is, and I, I hope he's still out there and doing well. Um, this one was an interesting story. Um, I got to watch my time here. Um, but uh, this was a harbor seal pup, and I'm not sure if you can see it, because our northern beaches here are so rocky, but there it is. Uh, and I'll just say that uh, when we went out to assess this seal pup on the bar, uh, so this is low tide, uh, my sister and I were standing back from the pup just discussing it, and we saw a woman walking across the bar right towards the seal, and, and, and my assistant Evan said, what, man, you know, watch out for the seal. And she was plugged into her, you know, her headset there. And she just walked right by, didn't, didn't see it at all. So they really blend in and she was in her own world. But anyway, the next day we get a call uh, that we, we realized from the markings on this seal, it was the same animal. It had come around the corner up West Street. If anyone's familiar with Bar Harbor and the, sea, the wonderful Seacoast Mission on West Street, uh, it, there's a little inlet there that flows in under the road under Route 3. And that's a little foreshadowing of what's to come. Uh, because two days later, on my birthday, of course, uh, at five in the morning, um, I get a call from the police department that there's a seal in the middle of the road uh, right here. And this was our little friend. And it was just dumping rain, as you can see. And uh, so I said, fine, we'll get on it. And uh, thankfully, some of our students that lived in town they already had two seal pups they were holding overnight that I, that's why I was up early, was to transport those two. Now we had three. And thankfully, uh, the rehab facility uh, down at National Marine Life Center in uh, Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, uh, said that they could take a third. I just love that crew. Uh, they were just right off the cuff. Yep, we'll take it. At six in the morning, they told me this. And uh, so Siobhan, our student who's now at vet school, uh, she said, I'll come and grab it, and she did, and she had, so now we had three seal pups, including uh, this little character, who uh, would go on to be named uh, Rosalind Franklin. Uh, National Marine Life Center had a uh, theme of naming seals after celebrities, and this celebrity, uh, they try and put the word seal in the name, so anyway, uh, named after one of my heroes, Rosalind Franklin. Uh, and uh, this is her, so she did very well. And look at these, these were all our pups. They're just such a gaggle, crazy bunch. Um, and that's her again, uh, getting bigger, her mature coat. And there she is again. And uh, thanks to National Marine Life Center for all these images. Here she's learning how to feed. And I will say that for my colleagues at the rehab centers, it's a lot of work rehabbing these seals, because these are pups. They have to teach them everything. Um, it's labor intensive, it's expensive. It's, it's not like going to the store and getting a little bit of you know, dog food or whatever. It's, um, uh, it's really involved work and they, they're just really marvelous. So uh, real shout out to them. And then uh, the release, which is always good fun. All right, uh, just to finish up a little bit about normal seal behaviors that people ask me. Um, lying on the side, this is uh, the banana pose that we often call it. I like to call it the happy pose. Here's a better example. This is the harp seal you saw earlier. Um, they will lie on their side and then it helps them in thermoregulating. But this is really normal. As I said, I like to call it the happy pose. It's, it's not the be all and end all to saying, oh yeah, well, it's fine. There could be other issues. But it's one thing that we look for. I've had seals that were so depressed and lethargic, the head was on the ground, they were just, they didn't even notice you were there. Whereas this, this harp seal, it knew I was there for sure. And this little fella here um, can't quite do the banana pose very well yet. <laughs> he's just little, uh, but he's just resting and, and looks pretty good. Uh, vocalizing, and I'm going to play the last thing. The next slide is the last one, and it's uh, a little video I took of a seal pup I had uh, this past uh, spring. A uh, nice, healthy pup, and it was vocalizing, and the, the harvest seal mom knows her pup's uh, particular vocalization. So um, 
you get that a lot. And it sounds like they're saying ma, um, which is, I guess, appropriate. Another thing I hear is the seal is having trouble getting around, looks really awkward on land. And I think some, I think it's hind flippers are injured because it's not using them. That it, it won't use the hind flippers. These are not sea lions. Sea lions do use the hind flippers. They, they're structurally built differently than seals. Um, so seals will only use the front flippers to sort of drag themselves along on land. And they just drag, the hind flippers don't come into play at all. They do when they're swimming. Then it's a different ball game altogether. Uh, the other thing is that I've noted that people talk about is uh, the pups uh, suckling on itself. They will nurse on themselves. They'll often sort of turn and try and suckle on their hind flipper. I've had them suckle, gosh, when I've been transporting them, I have them suckling on the carrier cage, uh, and sometimes they'll do that all the way down. <laughs> uh, but um, so all those behavior are, are pretty good. Uh, and oh, yeah, I forgot I had this one. Uh, I mentioned this pop up here was in nice shape, and I've already alluded to and talked about the Lanugo coat, and that's why the red flag, even though this pop uh, is lying on its side, it's got a nice fresh, that's an umbilicus you're seeing, not its intestines, which we get a lot of from people. Um, it looks pretty good, but the red flag for me is that it is a premature pup, and that is one I'd, I might monitor uh, if all is good and it's in a quiet spot. And if I had someone who could look out for it, if we don't, you know, if it's far away. Um, but otherwise, what happens when I do go away, people don't realize what we do in the background. Uh, I might leave the seal, but I'm working on the phone, texting, I'm talking to our colleagues at rehab. Can you take another seal pup? And sometimes I'm doing that with several pups at a time, trying to see uh, who can go where and um, what their status is. So for that little guy, that would be the red flag to me. Uh, down below, I've got two harp seals. The harp seal adult on the left is, um, shouldn't be in a field. That's really out of habitat. It's not actually too far from the water, but it, it, there was other issues going on. And that was one that we did take to rehab. And this harp seal on the right, this is a juvenile or beater. It's nice and healthy, bright, alert, responsive. It's nice and plump. You don't see any, you know, you don't see hips. It's nice, round. The thing is, it's on the side of the road uh, to the entrance of Acadia National Park on the Scudic Peninsula. So, and it had been across the street. We could see its marks that had been over the street to the bike path and back. So what we did was that, oh, it was pretty simple. We didn't have to take it anywhere because it's in good condition. We just herded it back to the water, which was just, you can't see it in the photo, but it's only about 30 feet away. So um, we just herded it towards the water and then like, we don't push them into the water. We like make it decision whether it wants to go or not. And it decided it had enough of us. <laughs> it wasn't too happy with us. Um, all right, this is the last, basically last slide, and then I'll show the video. It's a short video. Uh, I got a call from the fisherwoman in Tremont uh, who said, I, I think the seal looks great, just wanted to let you know. And she sent this photo, uh, Sarah Leiter, and uh, I thought, oh my God, and it's a nice, nice, uh, plump, good looking seal pop, looks great. And uh, I thought I'll go check it out because it's, I wanted to have a look at it because we don't, it's nice when you see nice, healthy pups. So this is the last. And you'll hear it vocalize in a minute. At one point, it sort of chases its flippers.
So this is in Tremont and it's just a pan around to sort of show you that it's not far from shore if it wants to haul out, which clearly it had before. And then we heard uh, when Sarah got back at the end of the day from fishing, uh, she said it, it was long gone and that was it. So, which I'm not surprised. That was a nice, healthy looking pup. And that's it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, Rosie, thank you so much. That was wonderful. If, um, if you at all in the audience like to put some questions in the chat box, if you have them, or raise your little blue hand, we'd be happy to take them. I do see one in the Q&A um, from Mary. Um, and she says, I would love to hear more of the Paco story because I had an incredible experience with Paco in my sailing class in Brooklyn and then in Blue Hill. Specifically, <laughs> Is it known how Paco died? Um, Poco, yeah, Poco the Blue actually uh, was named for a town in New Brunswick because that's where he was first seen and then he came down. He was, I think, off Boston and then seemed to like the coast of Maine better. Um, and Poco um, was, you know, uh, in the fall of that summer found dead. And of course, we thought right away that Poco died because he had this penchant for going up to boats. He liked boats. Um, but the, they, they did an opt a necropsy at Mystic Aquarium. Uh, they have belugas there, so they're really used to them, and the vets there did it. I think it, it was some illness. I can't remember what it was, but it had nothing to do with, with boat strikes or anything like that. Uh, again, when we heard Poco was found dead, we really thought, oh, gosh, we knew this was going to happen. He's going to be hit by a boat, but uh, that wasn't it. When you get a single beluga like that, it's what we call a solitary sociable. Uh, you can get them around, especially for the toothed whales. Uh, <laughs> baleen whales are typically, you know, solitary. Um, but when you get a beluga whale on its own, it, it's a phenomenon that happens. Um, you get to know some of these solitary sociables. Uh, you can get that with killer whales as well. Uh, but certainly we get them, I think, my guess is that they're from the Gulf of St. Lawrence population of, of beluga whales. So. Uh, but yeah, I don't know the exact cause of death. I'm not sure if they had, they may have had a, um, yeah, I don't know if they had a direct cause of death um, for Poco, but if I find out, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, um, but it wasn't a boat strike, so that, that was a good thing. And, and Poco, yeah, he finally came up to Mount Desert Island uh, when I got a call from kayakers off the west side. And they said, we have a beluga here. And I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> it's coming to my area. The irony is it wasn't a stranding because this animal was in habitat and it was not in distress. But I always used to say it was sort of behaviorally stranded because it's like, you should go home, <laughs> you know. Um, but there, you know, there's nothing to do with it. It's in habitat and it's fine, you know, um, but it's just going up to boats. And in fact, at one point, apparently it went from like Saco, Maine, followed a boat to Provincetown, Massachusetts, tip of Cape Cod, and then came back. So yeah, I interesting character, that one. You know. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. We have, yeah. we have a bunch more questions in the chat and yeah. then also a lot of praise for your wonderful presentation. Oh, yeah, no, it was fun. Um, Rosie, uh, Marguerite was asking, does the last young seal pup in the video still um, <laughs> with mother or? Uh, that one would have been still with mom. Yeah, they stay, they nurse for about four weeks. So. When we get the pupping time is usually sort of, we always take bets when is gonna be the first seal pup. It's usually sort of mid to late May, like May 18th, 19th, somewhere in there. And, and my birthday, May 26th is always pups. Um, and we're well into that. So, you know, by the end of June, in fact, we're sort of happily into weaned pup time, which for us that deal with Harper seal pups, it's we can't wait to the end of June because it means we have a, independent pup. And when you have an independent harbor seal pup, if I have a, an independent harbor seal pup on a busy lobster pound that's in the way, I can remove it and take it far away. That's fine. But if it's a dependent pup on mom, 
then I have issues and I have to see work with you know those at the lobster pan or, or wherever and usually fine it's like let's just put them off the dock or you know out of harm's way and if he continues to come back and that happens uh, then I'll, I'll have to take them to rehab uh, it just happens that we have to do that so uh, but yeah four weeks is roughly the, the nursing period and that's it they're on their own yeah even though they're just little fellas, you know. Pretty quick. Cool. Cool. We're, we're yeah. Weeks, they're off doing well, it. If you think that's fast, the fastest is um, the hooded seal. I showed you that hooded seal. That That's a youngster, that one that I showed. It's what are called a blueback because they're born with that sort of blue gray pelage or fur. Um, their nursing period is four days. That's it. It's fast and furious on the ice flows. Uh, it's a very uh, high fat content milk. And then, bam, mom's out of there. You know, you're on your own, kid. <laughs> so. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, another question we have is, if an animal is successfully rehabilitated, do you try to return them to the, the location of their stranding, or is that important? Yeah, that's not important. Um, they really have a good sense of where they are. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we have brought them back uh if you know they're in good shape they're at what's called the release weight because they have to be at a release weight uh that's ideal and uh so they're healthy and if they don't mind a few hours drive up north we have done some releases up here which is kind of fun for us and for our volunteers to see a nice healthy pop and especially one if it's come from here uh to now see it healthy and uh, and plump and so on um but you know you do that cautiously because um uh, it, it still is, um, you know, it, it's a stressor, you know, doing that transportation. But, but generally, uh, like our pups at National Marine Life Center and uh, by Cape Cod, uh, Buzzards Bay, they'll be released. Uh, there's usually a place I think they do on Cape Cod itself, um, but, but they don't need to, to, to be back up here. But that's a really great question. Thanks, Rosemary. Mm -hmm. uh, Beverly was wondering about the, the pup's vulnerability on the beach. And if, for example, like if they're in danger of like dogs, you know, coming on the beach and, and bothering them and stuff. Uh, well, we always ask folks, you know, when, when we talk to individuals on the phone, they say, yeah, you know, in fact, we often get my dog found the seal because the rock, they blend into the rocky beach. Uh, but I, you know, in my experience, most people are, are so good at saying, oh, I put my dog on the leash and I've kept it away, I've kept it in or whatever. Um, because the other thing is that that seal could give some harmful disease or virus to your dog, your pet, and, and vice versa. So, um, and you know, you don't want um, the, the pup, whether it's your dog or the seal pup, getting, getting hurt. Um, there is potential predation. Um, you, you know, you can have uh, terrestrial animals that uh, might prey. Um, or prey on the animal. We actually had a call, a, a woman phoned and said that a bald eagle had come down on the seal pup and picked it up. And I went to see her and uh, um, she showed the photos and, and she was right. She, she'd run up and took some photos and, and actually the eagle just left the pup alone. I think because eagles, bald eagles tend to be more uh, scavengers and that's a lot of work to have to kill that seal pup. So I think it came down thinking it's a free meal and the seal lashed at this little pup, lashed out at the eagle. You see these photos are incredible. And then the eagle sat next to it and was like, I don't know what to do, you know, and it left it alone. And in the end, it was a seal pup. It was gaining weight, so we didn't want to remove it. But in the end, uh, there was a big storm and I think we had a disconnect. And so we, we, we took the pup to rehab, which I know the woman who phoned it in she was so relieved when I took it um, but you know we for predators you know if you have a healthy seal on shore it's not a stranding it's not a stranding remember I look after strandings and no I don't want it to be preyed upon but such is nature and life and uh, I believe me I've had some sleepless nights with some of these little guys you know hoping they'll be okay and and uh and so on but um i look after strandings and if it's you know if it's an animal in habitat it's not in distress and it's healthy then i don't intervene thanks rosie 
Yeah. We have two similar kind of questions. Um, one of them is, are there still opportunities to volunteer for al allied whale? And then also, is there a number to call if, if somebody finds a stranded animal on the beach? Right on your screen, should be. Right here, the cell number. Um, it's best to call. Some people will go on Facebook and say, hey, come and look at the seal. But we don't always go to the Facebook page. Um, so it is really best to phone the cell phone number. I, I have that with me all the time, pretty much, um, unless Lindsay takes it <laughs> from me. Um, and um, or, or you can uh, the Allied Well office you can do as well. Uh, but we're in, sort of sporadically in there um, because of COVID. So um, and volunteering. Oh boy, right now. Um, it's been so tough, I couldn't use any volunteers this summer. Not really, a uh, few experienced ones up at uh, my colleague, Dr. Gail Cross at the University of Maine and some of her students were all in a bubble. And I had several animals uh, that they kindly went to look at. Um, and so that really worked well. And, uh, and my colleague, Lindsay, who directs the Humpback Whale Catalogs and Allied Whale helped me with several as well. But we couldn't use, um, our, our students are pretty much gone in the summer, but we usually have a, a complement of interns, of five interns. We couldn't do our internship program. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't use interns, we couldn't use students. Only this fall were we able to use some of our COA students if they had their own vehicle so that they weren't in the stranding truck with me, unfortunately. Um, uh, but right now we're getting to the quieter time, uh, sort of November, December, although I have to say I went to a fresh dead harbor seal yesterday um, that may have had blunt force trauma in what I saw. But anyway, um, I say just email me. Uh, my email is on here. Feel free to do that. Um, express your interest interest because we do like uh, volunteers in different parts and we certainly if you're Blue Hill or wherever on our coast um, always glad to have volunteers uh, to be our eyes and ears to get trained to go out uh, and assist um, and we try and do two I say try because we couldn't this year uh, we did our winter stranding workshop in January we try and do one in April for the, the springtime animals, you know, harbor seal pups and cetaceans, and we couldn't do that uh, this year. And so I know my colleague Lindsay and I are trying to sort out what to do for our winter workshop that may be doing something like this, a, a Zoom workshop, uh, which would be good because then anybody can participate in that without physically having to come to COA. Um, which is too bad, uh, well, it's not too bad. The Zoom is great because it draws in so many people, but it's really great to, obviously, as we all know, to be in person with one another. And unfortunately, that's just gonna have to wait a little bit, so. But email me um, if you're interested in volunteering or you have questions. Uh, I always say we're here for all your marine mammal needs, not just, you know, um, ask about humpbacks. If you have a question, uh, feel free to do that. It doesn't have to be about strings. Thank you, Rosie. I will send out a follow-up email to everyone who has registered and include all the information, the links and the cell phone numbers in your email sure. and send that out to people along with the recording so people can be in touch with you. Um, I know there was a question. Uh, there was something I wanted to touch on about the legalities of marine mammals, um, if I can cut in. Um, was um, We do get asked about what if I find a seal skeleton on the beach? Um, can I take the bones home? Because it's kind of cool. Uh, it can be a display or a scientific project for my son or what have you. Um, the answer to that is that, yes, you, you can and you can't. <laughs> um, there is something called a beachcombers clause. And I think this makes a lot of sense uh, when I heard about it years ago. But if you find, uh, some whale bones, for example. The thing is, if it's a whale bones from a right whale, regretfully you cannot have it. Um, but if it were whale bones from a humpback, which is now delisted, so not endangered here, and it's an incomplete skeleton, you can. So it needs to be an incomplete carcass. or uh, You wouldn't want marine mammal parts, they stink. But if you have nice clean bones, if it's an incomplete skeleton and it is an un, and it's not an endangered species, you can have, you can take them home. 
what they do like you to do. And a good example is uh, I had this gentleman phone our lab, said I was out walking the beach with my grandson on MDI. Uh, we came across, we think, it's, we think it's seal bones and there was quite a collection. Uh, could we bring them in and verify that? And I said, sure. So once he was in, I explained about the Marine Mammal Protection Act. But I said, because it's not a complete skeleton, we could see that it wasn't complete, and we able to ID it to a harbor seal, they're not endangered, uh, I said, you can keep the bones. And I said, what you do need to do though, um, I don't know if this is grave in stone, but it's a good idea to do it. Um, because if someone finds the bones at your house and says, what are you doing with marine mammal bones? That's illegal. You can say, ah, but I've got my certificate from NOAA Fisheries that says it's okay. So just write to NOAA Fisheries, and, and for us, that would be either Ainsley Smith or Mindy Guerin at the regional office in Gloucester, and I'm happy to give you that info. Um, and just say, hey, you know, uh, and this is what this gentleman did, said that, that, gave the date, the location, this is what we found, even gave photos, said that they spoke to me and Toby Stevenson at Allied Whale. We even said what it was, it was incomplete. I understand Beachcombers Clause, blah, blah, blah. And they got a letter back saying, yes, you're right. You can have the bones. Here's a number for that animal. And then put them on your mantelpiece. So, yeah, but again, if it's an endangered species and it's a complete skeleton, uh, you can. Thanks for addressing that, Rosie. Oops. That was great. Yeah, no worries. Well, this has been absolutely awesome. Um, I know, I know that it's a little bit after five and people probably have dinners. Yeah, to sorry about that. To. No, not at all. Thank you for, for taking the extra time to answer questions and to be with us. Oh, I'm glad to. Um, not a problem. Yeah. It's been so wonderful. So much informative information has been shared, I think, that's really going to be helpful to all of us. Not at all. Thank yeah. you for all the work you do. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, that was good fun. And, and thanks for everyone for being here. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Rosie. It was awesome. All right, take care. Have a great night. Are we it? I no. think so. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else got questions? <laughs> <laughs> that was so wonderful. I, I learned so much because I've had incidences where I found seal pups on the beach and haven't known what to do. So that was so, so helpful. Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I, you know, there are times where we're stymied too. Um, you know, it's not, it's not always clear cut at all. Uh, you know, we'll look at a seal and go, oh God, what do I do with you? Mm -hmm. Do you need to go or not? We are really stymied. They're really tough calls sometimes. If you have a lethargic seal, it's skinny, easy. But if it's not, and, but there's some things that you're a bit bothered by, and that's where you have to do the wait and see. And, and this is where volunteers come in. If they can be your ears and eyes and say, hey, I can go there. I live down the street. Yeah. That's hugely, hugely helpful. So, yeah. That's great. But, but yeah, we're, we're, we can be stymied too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can pick up an animal and bring it to rehab and think, why did I do this? This is a perfectly healthy animal. Only to find, no, it was a good call. You know, so yep. sometimes it's just your gut feeling comes into play as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Um, yeah. it, I, I'm going to send out a follow up email, as I mentioned. So if there, if there are any resources that you think would be helpful or that you wanted to send to me to put in that follow up email, feel free to do that. Sure. Um, otherwise, yeah. I jotted a few things down and Lindsay was wonderful. She posted some stuff in the chat for us um, as well. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah, I thought Lindsay was on. So. Uh, but yeah, and people can email if they have questions or whatever, but happy yeah. to do that. So yeah, good fun. Yeah. Well, thank you. Again. I, I learned a lot doing it too. What's that? Oh, just thank you again so much. It's been a oh, wonderful yeah. time. My, my pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Take care. All right. See you everyone. Bye everybody.